Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Welcome to a very special Dream Huntress interview with Jackie Gross. And joining me today is Meadow Caulfield. She's been my co-host before, and Meadow was also a finalist in Extreme Huntress, so I can think of no better person to interview Jackie than Meadow today. And they have a lot of history together, as you'll find out. Meadow and Jackie, welcome to the show. And Meadow, here you go. Thanks, Bruce. Hi, everyone. I'm just so happy to have Jackie on here today, and I regret that this is the first time I've seen her face since I was last in Dallas. And Jackie is a spitfire. She is a lady full of energy, and she's driven, but she's also very real and a very kind person. And I just wanted to start off the conversation with the story. Jackie, thank you for coming first off. One of the things about Jackie I really love and have a lot of respect for is this ability to handle things under pressure. She does a lot of stuff very well under pressure. And when we did meet a Extreme Huntress, correct? And I want you to go ahead and give a piece on that too. But we got to spend a full week together during that competition. And Jackie, she plays a supportive role since she won Extreme Huntress a while back and has been at all of the competitions and supporting the women and that project. And then this year, she got to do the ultimate Extreme Huntress, which is a pretty amazing thing. And I can't wait to hear about it. So Jackie, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to answer some questions that y'all have. And I know some of the stuff I won't be able to give you all the detail until the episodes air. But as they air, we can have another show and we can continue on to talk more about Africa and more about what some of the competitions were. But I can't let y'all know what those are until after episodes start airing. That's the tough part there. I knew what happened last time. So this time it's going to be really tough to span those episodes out because I really am curious how things went. Now, everyone, I just want to tell you a quick story about Jackie. And I was at the Extreme Huntress competition down in Texas last year with her. And I was one of the contestants and I was pretty stressed out. And it was the first animal I harvested while I was there. And I was hanging the animal up and I had already been in a stressful situation. I actually made a poor shot and felt pretty bad about it. And I was putting the animal up on the gamble and raising it on a boat winch. And I hadn't had the clicker, the backstop on the clicker and everyone's standing around and the camera's on you and everyone's telling you one thing or another. And Jackie's saying, you got to do this and do that. And I have my process in my mind and everyone's jabbering. At some point I look at Jackie and say, Jackie, chill. And it was just a cranky response. It was a quick response and I felt really bad, but I was just trying to get things done. And man, I thought about it. I thought, oh man, I hope I didn't burn something there, burn a bridge there. And a couple of minutes later, after I cooled down and I'd taken care of my animal and put it away, I walked up and I approached Jackie and I apologized and told her that I was under a lot of stress and I didn't mean to come off sharp. And Jackie didn't even have a sharp tone in her voice or anything along those lines. She quickly accepted the apology and we talked it out and we hugged. And I think after that moment, I adored Jackie because she's real enough to be able to go ahead and to accept apologies and go forward, even though I was out of line. And so that right there was, for me, a reflection of Jackie's true person. Anything to add, Jackie? No, you know, I'll tell you what, like Meadow said, the gals, I just had to do it this year as well. We're under a lot of pressure and we're under a lot of stress and you're hunting every day and you're competing in these very and strenuous competitions. And you do get stressful. And one of the biggest things where I've learned over the years that some of our gals that are the best of the best, they don't do very well under stress. And so as a, they call me mama bear, my goal and what my job is to do is to make sure that I keep those gals, not necessarily in line, but make sure that they have somebody to go to for those type of situations. Because seven days of lots of early mornings, you don't know what's happening. You don't know what competitions you're doing. You don't know what you're hunting. And it was really nice. And, you know, as far as Meadow, like I always told her, like it takes a bigger person to go and apologize for something than it does just to kind of 
clap it off. But it was really nice that Meadow and I were able to talk about that type of situation. And she still performed very well for the competition. And everybody's winners, no matter what place you get. But I've always kind of envied a lot of things that Meadow gets to do in her real job and also in her hunting atmosphere because I don't have those options all the time in the stuff that I do on a day-to-day basis. But it was really fun to be able to hunt with all the women. Hunted and got to be with, I think, 36 women in the past five years since I've been helping do this. And it's truly something uh, we all have that one thing in common, and and it's that passion for outdoors. And it doesn't matter. We're all cranky at times, right? We just got to move forward and just kind (laughs) of go from there. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that, though. I told you before, I appreciate that about you. And I really brought it home for me about who you really are. And so it was a real treat. And it's one of those things where I'm not easy. Sometimes it takes a bit for me to trust folks or let them in. And that was one of those moments where I'm like, you know what? I Jackie's real. I can trust Jackie. So <laughs> Yes, really you can. Good. I have that <laughs> firsthand knowledge for her and TJ. So Jackie, let's go back to your first extreme huntress, and then we can go forward to the ultimate extreme huntress. Okay, so back in 2011, I was looking for different options for me to go hunting. That time in my life, I wasn't really able to afford like these big hunts, and I seen the extreme hunters competition. And it mentioned uh, your true passion about hunting, submit an essay, and then if you make the top 10, the world will vote. And so in 2012, this competition started in 11, and then I actually won the competition in 2012. And I got to travel to Zimbabwe, Africa to hunt dangerous game. And it was just something that I never thought that I would had ever did a lifetime back then. But once I've actually experienced Africa and experienced extreme hunters, it really changed my life forever. I tell people, they're like, well, how did it change your life forever? That's some of the questions that they ask. And they ask like, how, what's your journey been since you've been with extreme hunters? And I could tell you extreme hunters changed my life so much that I named my little boy after my PH in Africa that I hunted with. And I guess I just never realized we have our little bubble where we're from and the hunting, but extreme hunters helped me to reach out and look at the other aspects of hunting and wildlife conservation. And I would have never known that if it wasn't for the competition. A lot of folks ask me, well, why do you keep supporting it? Sometimes there's drama and this and that. Well, I'll tell you what, no matter what competition you have, if you got six women together for a week, there's always going to be something, no matter what y'all are doing. That's just how it is. But the reason for Extreme Hunters is I get to meet people like Meadow and all the gals for all these years, 36 women, like I mentioned, all of us share the same love for the game. We want to help wildlife conservation. We want to in tune our kids into being in the outdoors and we all have that same passion and for me to be able to stay with extreme hunters that's why i've supported it and helped coordinate it for so many years because that's us we're women we are i want to say the badasses of the outdoors that's just how it is and i just kind of feel extreme hunters help me to learn more about myself and more about how i can protect our wildlife and i would have never ever known that if i would have never entered it and so i've been supporting it for eight years. So, and then now I'm in the ultimate extreme hunters. What's the difference, Jackie? So for the extreme hunters, last year was our 10th anniversary. So we had 10 previous winners. And so what they did was for the ultimate extreme hunters, they had four gals. They sent out an email to all the gals to see who would be able to attend this trip for the ultimate extreme hunters. And there was four of us that were able to attend this trip. And we competed against each other for the ultimate extreme hunters competition for all of us to represent and have a different title instead of an additional extreme hunters. And from this point forward, we'll see if it's ultimate extreme hunters or extreme hunters. But all it is is the finale of all of the 10 previous winners and four that were chosen and competed against each other for the ultimate extreme hunters competition. Want to become a smarter deer hunter? Know when to hunt, where to hunt, how to hunt? Well, Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created to do exactly that. Because many people have told me they struggle with spending all days in the wood and never seeing a deer. Only shooting does and young deer. Leaving the woods empty-handed way too many times. Found this wonderful, but just couldn't get on them. Having difficult finding a place to hunt. Recognizing possible mistakes you're making every year. Having tried and failed 
to find qualified mentors who deliver results. If you had these frustrations or struggles, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and there you'll find a 13-module course to help you solve these problems. Again, go to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and find some answers. This year, the ladies were prior winners, so the competition was even more steep, I think. But one of the things that I really noticed about this year is that you guys are all very supportive of each other. That's Mm -hmm. a very genuine difference. And I really, I mean, the ladies have always been supportive, but this time you guys are very positive towards each other, which is great. Yeah, actually, the crazy thing is that three of us had never met each other, and I would only knew one of the gals, so it was pretty unique for us to not meet each other, but we were together 22 days, so 22 days compared to Oh, my goodness. I didn't realize so, that. Yeah, we were together for, once you count travel time, and whenever we were in uh, Texas as well at the FTW Ranch, if you add up our travel days and... So, yep. So that's how long we were together for. So you, we really created this bond that nobody will ever be able to take away. And, and another bond that it'll be so hard to explain (laughs) our experiences because it was truly a great, unique year. If you would ask me the difference between when I went to Zimbabwe in 2012 to when I went in 2019, it's exactly the same except the people. I got to be around some amazing women and amazing outfitters and Despontane Safari is who we hunted with, and it was truly one of the best hunts that I can say that I've been on in the Save Conservancy. I mean, I also hunted another area in, in Zimbabwe, but this was truly a unique experience to be in the bush for 12 days straight, just in Africa, not counting travel, but just watching every sunrise and sunset was truly so majestic that I can't give you a visual until you start watching the episodes. I really look forward to it. (laughs) That's going to be awesome. (laughs) So it was one of the things that a lot of people ask, and and it's one of those points of debate oftentimes about uh, hunting and promoting hunting to the general public and the future of hunting. And a lot of people's exposure to hunting, and the non-hunting public at least, is through TV and the internet. And a lot of people that you do see aren't necessarily the best representation. Sometimes they, they put a bad taste in folks' mouths. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, Extreme Huntress and then Tom and Olivia uh, and how they put that pro- project together is that it's a very good representation of hunters. And so I guess I wanted to move into why it's different than your average hunting show and what it is that makes it a special in that regard. So for Extreme Huntress, they have various hunting shows, like you had mentioned, and then they have the Extreme Huntress show. For those of you who have watched hunting shows, you kind of anticipate exactly what's going to happen. You know, you're going to go, you're going to arrive, you're going to get there, you're going to eat, you're going to drink, and then next thing you're going to be hunting. Extreme Hunters is more than that. It's more of a bond between people who have a passion to make a change and to be leaders in the industry. But we as women, they don't call Mother Nature for just no in particular reason. <laughs> Mother Nature it's a priceless gift that we have as moms and we have as women in the industry and Extreme Hunter shares and elaborates on that. You talk about divorce rates and how we as women are going to be leaders and you don't necessarily see that in the other hunting shows or through social media. You just 90% of the time see the men hunting, a face of somebody that you may know like Eva Shockey, for example. I think Eva Shockey is amazing, but we know that that is her day-to-day job. She's a mom, she's fixing to have another baby and that is what she does. But for us, it's real girls that representation that other women have in the industry like I guess I would say the famous hunting women we are all just the everyday usual gals we do this we love this and that's why I think extreme hunters is a little bit different because it doesn't always go well I mean it is a challenge they share that we are not perfect by no means we are the ambassadors of the industry because if mom and dad go hunting our kids will go hunting and also and this is just how I feel Meadow is that we don't always have to get the hunters on board. We as women can get other people on board who are non-hunters and extreme hunter shares that as well. You don't have to be a hunter to support hunting. You could be a non-hunter, but for women being the role models and the leaders of, like I said, we call it mother nature for a reason, extreme hunters really captures that for wildlife conservation and how to sustain our habitat. So that's why I 
think it's different than most of the other shows. And I would agree. I think it's great. Definitely has a different feel. And if I was to ask that the general public had to see one representation of a hunting show or media, that is the number one I would give as an example, because it is such a positive representation. And like you said, it's not our day job. (laughs) We're not Cabela is a large organization behind us that pays for our content or anything along those lines. We're motivated because we love it. And that's what we do with our free time. Otherwise we're working. That's right. I know. Look at me and you right now. (laughs) (laughs) You're both in your offices, right? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I'm on my lunch break. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, we got to fit it in where we can, especially with so many different time zones. I know. So I had the chance to meet your family and same for you, but I love taking my daughter hunting. She's six now and I've got her riding a bike when I bird hunt. It's tough because I don't, when the dog goes on point too far off the road, I got to try and drag her in there and carry her on my back. (laughs) That's kind of one of the ways I've been bringing her into the outdoors. And so I know you've got chap and what are you guys doing these days? I saw some photos on Instagram or Facebook. So there's different things. So Chap actually got to experience his first bow hunt with me this year. Well, not his. It was my bow hunt, but he thinks he was hunting, of course. I was hunting turkey. It was a a big challenge for me to take him hunting because he talked. He was like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why, 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 why? I kind of feel they can sense like our adrenaline rush, like right before we're fixing to do something. So before I made the shot on my turkey and I go to draw back my bow, He like kind of froze and was holding on to my leg. For that hunt, he did really, really well. But for me, I took him bear hunting last weekend with me. We were scouting out for bear. And I'll tell you what, I have these little bitty, teeny tiny Steiner optics and they fit perfect. They're not too heavy and he loves them. He feels like he's doing everything. We get out. If I get out, he gets out. He does every single thing that we do. He loves the outdoors. Do I think I could take him on an elk hunt yet for archery? Probably not. (laughs) <laughs> because of the hiking, because I'll have to pack, unless I know the, where they're coming in at. But I have a sheep hunt this year for exotics, and I also have rifle hunts. And I do feel that I'll be able to take them with me, and we'll see how it goes. I'll let you know the outcome, so call me. But he just loves it, and I think they kind of, like with you, I know your daughter could feel your energy, and they could feel my energy and how exciting it is. I haven't ran into like a lot of problems. And the funny thing is I could share a video with you guys. And he's like hunting for a deer. He thinks because he has his little gun and he, and I asked him, I'm like, buddy, what are you going to do if you kill a deer? And he goes, mommy, I'm going to put it in the freezer and eat it. And it's like the funniest thing ever. Cause <laughs> I didn't give him any, I mean, he's three. And that's yeah. what he thinks. After we kill an animal, we harvest it and we put up all our own meat and stuff. Like he helps because he takes all the packages after we process everything and he puts it in the crate so we could take to the freezers. And we've just made him to be a part of everything. Cause that's what he is. And that's who he's my little boy. Yeah. That's awesome. And I was going to say, that's what I do. I just- She always has a job or something to do, whether it's carrying a bird or she's in charge of the scrap pile when I'm butchering. (laughs) There's something. And I think it's great that you're involving them just as much. And I think so many people miss the boat when they don't involve their children at a young age or they give up on things for a while. And it's just a matter of taking them along. And you're not going to be able to take them on everything. You can't take them on a heavy elk hunt, but you can take them on a dove hunt where you sit or in a blind. And I I think it's great that you're doing that too and I didn't expect any different but <laughs> do you want to become a smarter white deal hunter knowing when to hunt where to hunt how to hunt over the past four years people have asked me hey I'm struggling with spending all day in the woods and never seeing a deer only getting opportunities at doe or young bucks leaving the woods empty-handed too many seasons. Located the deer of a lifetime, but just flat out missed. Having difficulties finding a place to hunt? Recognizing mistakes that you're making over and over again, and you want to eliminate them. Having tried and failed to find qualified mentors? Well, you've come to the right place. Why? Because Deer Hunting Institute Part 1 was created by me, Bruce Hutchins. It's a 13-module course that'll talk about being lost in the deer hunting forest, never edited hunted, what is a hunter, what is an adult onset hunter, what rules apply, finding a mentor, choosing a weapon, finding a place to hunt, scouting a hunt location, stand sites, stand access and exit, reading sign, and when to hunt. 
All these are available for you at DeerHuntingInstitute.com. Go now to DeerHuntingInstitute.com and sign up for the best deer hunting course in America. Well, what do you think, Bruce? Is there something else you have on your mind? Well, I wanted to ask Jackie, and, well, both of you, to give advice, 30%, 40% of my listeners are women. I would assume some are married, some are not. Some have kids. So you just gave some great advice. So let's stay on that a little bit. And either you can answer first, how do you make the decision to take your kids? Like chap, it's three, and your daughter is six. So how do you fit it all in? Well, I, and Jackie's separated from her family too, by distance, but I don't have family nearby. I'm in Minnesota. My family's in California. So I don't really have anyone that can watch my kid. And I have her most weekends. It turns out if you want to do what you love to do, you've got to take them. And unless the weather is bad, and what I mean by bad is it's wet, I'll take her on snow and frozen days. But it depends on the activity. And I adjust my activity when I have her. And so instead of maybe going on a death march through the brush, I pack her bike and let her ride the bike down the road. And I work the dogs on the road for birds. For me, it's making adjustments and then going all out when I don't have her and hunting how I would without her. But at this point for me, it's whether or not I have her that makes that determination. And I just adjust accordingly, but I don't give up on what I want to do. I go fish, I go and hunt, I go and train dogs. And she just has a role, some former manner in there. How about you, Jackie? I only have one biological child and I do have two stepdaughters that I've had at a very young age, but for mothers with the, like their first child and they're big into hunting or outdoors, it's kind of like that first day whenever they're like a year old and you take them to the grocery store and you're like, oh my gosh, are they going to scream? Are they going to kick? Are they going to grab everything? And you're kind of like, okay, well, it's okay. You leave the grocery store and you made it work and you figured it out and maybe you got to keep them strapped into their seat while you unload the groceries with the air on, right? You figure <laughs> yeah. out those challenges, those roller coasters. And the same thing with hunting for Chap. He is three. So the first time I took him, it was hard, but I wasn't prepared. Now I know I need to make sure I have snacks and make sure I have drinks. And I got him his own little binoculars. So he feels like he's participating and he doesn't know anything different because he's participating and he's doing exactly what mommy's doing. Mommy's holding up her binoculars. And then, like I said, during season, I'll let y'all know in October how well he does because I'll be taking him in my exotic sheep hunt. But those are just the little roller coasters and you figure it out. Moms figure it out. It's kind of like no matter what you do with the child, you figure it out and you entertain the child or you do something to make them feel like they fit in. Like Meadow said, she makes her daughter, tells her, oh, you're helping or makes her be a part. And then the kids are fine with it. Chap, I mean, Mr. Bruce, you got to meet Chap. He's a firecracker. He <laughs> is know? a firecracker. Yeah. And so, and that's what it is. You make him be a part of it. And as soon as he feels like he's doing what all the rest of the folks are doing, he doesn't know any different. And you got to keep him entertained. I talked about my step girls, uh, Brecken and Ashlyn. I had them since they've been five and seven and they're fixing to be almost 10 years now. And we learned doing a 10 hour day glassing was probably not the right idea. So we just did a morning hunt with them. And so they learned how to hunt in the evening as they got older. We let them take their BB guns whenever we were elk hunting, but then we learned that they wanted to shoot everything with their BB guns. So those are just challenges that you go through taking them. And then the things that they like, you just continue on with those. The things they don't like, you just kind of take that out of the equation and just move forward. Yeah. And I find, like you said, things they like, sometimes it's picking agates or looking at mushrooms or catching insects, you know, <laughs> if you have to take a little break to do that. And then the other thing is gear. It's hard to find good gear for kids, but kids need gear like those Steiner optics you have for them. Boots, optics, things like that, that make them feel they belong and they're a part of it. And then it's not enjoyable if they don't have the right gear. They're cold, they're wet, or their shoes aren't good enough for the activity. For example, I did a road trip from Minnesota to California for my mom out here and we got to the Badlands and I realized that I should have just bucked up and bought my daughter a nice pair of hiking boots like I did last time. And so I ended up having to stop in Montana or it was Eastern North Dakota and buy her a pair. And after that, we were fine. I even bought her a rock hammer and it's not hunting, but 
we got to do things we wanted to do after that. We went fossil hunting and we hiked around and before with the wrong shoes, it was different. I guess that's the other tip is get the best gear you can afford for the kids within reason. And it does help the experience if they've got their own equipment that they can use and feel like they're part of it. Let's switch it back now to extreme hunters. Now, Jackie, opening voting for, is it 25% of the total is popular vote? Is that correct? So they had the total that started for the previous voting that I was actually able to win that section. And so this second phase of voting will only be 3% for the final score. The other phase of voting was, it was added together, but this is just going to be 3% of the final score. So the previous voting was our percentage, the judges votes the percentage, how we performed in the competitions is a percentage, how well we hunted is all percentages and that's added together for our total score. And so for the next three months, it'll be the final 3% of our score. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize that. I mean, that's critical because there's four ladies and they're all world-class huntress, great people. Oh my goodness. So that's going to make a huge difference. So people really need to vote, don't they? They really need to vote. And these votes count. I always tell everybody, I know with the election and stuff, they're like, oh, does this vote count? Yes, y'all. These votes do count. And the biggest thing that they found, which I'll let y'all know, there was over 2,000 votes last go around that was not confirmed. And that could have affected who won first. Yes, I actually won the first place for voting, but you got to make sure you confirm the vote. After you vote, they send you an email and you can confirm it. And if you don't confirm and your vote does not count. So you may see like in the phase that voting's like you're higher up there, but once the finalization is complete and they close the voting, that's going to tally up and your percentage may be different if those folks never confirmed. Okay. And where do people vote? You could go to extremehunters.com. And then they'll have the ultimate extreme hunters gals up there, the tab. And then you scroll down and then they'll have all of our names. There's four of us competing. And then you select the name, you enter your email address, and then you'll receive an email from, I think it's Poll Daddy. I'll have to confirm that. And then you confirm your email. And you only can vote once. Is that correct? So far, yes. But what they did, we have three months of voting. I'm going to think that they're probably going to have some special weeks where they may be like, hey, how many people can we get to vote for such and such this week and you could win something? I don't know all that information yet until they actually announce it. And then I'll have more idea of all the different phases of voting. But so far, it's one vote per IP address. Right. And so Tom will announce some special things October, November, and December. We know that's going to happen. We just don't know what and when. That's correct. Yes, sir. And they'll have an episode that will air a week, a month. Yeah. One episode per week. I think there's going to be like 20 plus episodes and that's going to go all the way out till the end of December. And I think the first week of January and the winner is going to be announced at Dallas Safari Club in January. Hey, thanks for listening to the show tonight. Before we go, can I take a moment and say thank you? Listen, as we started the Whitetail Rendezvous podcast journey, we had no idea what to expect. But after four years, we received a ton of feedback from our over 400,000 listeners and climbing to half a million. Speaking of which, we are now closing in on over 600 featured guests. Thank you. And a quick shout out to all those who have left an iTunes review and your feedback. I get those and really appreciate it. And it's awesome to see what you have to say. And we do read every single one of them. And I just want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for your kind words regarding the show. And all the ratings and reviews help us attract more listeners. And if you're one of those new listeners, welcome. Great to have you. By the way, if you haven't taken the time to rate and review our show and like the Hunting on Private Land strategy on how to get permission to hunt a private property, go to whitetailrendezvous.com as a special gift for just rating and reviewing our show. When you get there, look for the start button to get the details. Listen, I'll share you the top technique from some of the top hunters in the country on how do they get permission to hunt on private land. I'll share with you the exact techniques they use to get permission. As my way of saying thanks 
for rating and reviewing the show on iTunes. So join us next time. And remember, we're all on this journey together, learning, sharing, and becoming 365 Hunters. Why don't you just recap it and compartmentalize it so people can understand where to vote, when to vote, and how to watch all 20 episodes. Okay. All right. So in order to vote, you go to ExtremeHunters.com. Go to the Extreme Hunters tab. You'll see at the top, Ultimate Extreme Hunters. Select your finalists on who you want, hopefully Jackie Guccini, and then enter your email address. And then confirm your email whenever you receive the email from Poll Daddy. I believe it's Poll Daddy. I don't know, Bruce. I'm sorry. Okay. Exactly what it is until Tom sends it out. But it's just basically go to ExtremeHunters.com, select the finalists, confirm your vote, and then they'll have 26 episodes, one episode per week. They're about 15 to 20 minutes, and they'll have one a week. So that way you can watch all the way to the end of December. And the winner is announced at Dallas Safari Club. Hopefully everybody's got that. If you don't get have that down, just go to extremehunters.com or if all else fails, just send me an email at whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com. I'll get you in touch with Jackie or I'll send you the link or whatever because it's important to all four ladies because they're all world-class ladies that have hunted and they deserve your votes. And 3% will make the difference in who wins and who loses. There's no question about it. Metal, your thoughts on voting since you were part of it? Like Jackie said, it's going to be pretty close and voting is going to make a difference. Last year, it got really tight at the end. You're all supposedly very close at the end. And it ended up the lady, by coincidence, that did have the most social support uh, won. And not to say that it's not based on her skill or anything along those lines, but it did make a difference in the outcome. And so I think it's very important that people go and make a point to vote and pick your favorite lady if you don't know any of them personally. And be sure to vote. And confirmation is huge. What happens is you vote on the website with your email address, and then you receive an email, most likely from Poll Daddy, but like Jackie said, it could be different. And you have to click a link that confirms that you are in fact a person, not just a robot. And so you do have to click a link within an email in order for that vote to count to be confirmed. And so she's referring to. Jackie, why don't you just summarize your speech? You're standing at Dallas Safari Club, and you won Ultimate Extreme Huntress. What are you going to say to the crowd? Oh, gosh, that's... I really feel that we are most hunters are ambassadors for the sport. I'm going to thank everybody, of course, for everything that they've done to support me, and I'm going to let them know that I'll be one of their leaders to be able to help get more women and children involved, and I'm never going to change. Meadow mentioned it. She knows me. I am the real deal, and I will do everything I can to try to help inspire women and help empower them and teach them and get them the right connections so they can go out hunting and be in the outdoors and educate them so that way they can learn and about wildlife conservation and how to sustain our habitat because that's really huge. And if we lose that, then we lose everything. And our kids, as grandkids, will never be able to see wildlife. But probably, like I said, the speech would just be thanking everybody. And I worked really, really hard. And I feel like me, as well-earned and well-deserved, we are all amazing winners, no matter who comes in first through fourth. But it would just truly feel like I've put in six years for a reason because I really believe in this. And I'm never going to stop believing in this. And so, yeah, so it would just be very exciting if I would win. (laughs) She's my ultimate extreme huntress. Like she said, she's helped a lot of women get through that competition and made a lot of connections with ladies over the years. And I definitely have a big spot in my heart for Jack. I can't say enough about how great she is. And I really can't wait to see the episodes air, Jackie. Thanks. With that, we're going to end episode number one with Jackie Guccini on Extreme Huntress. And we'll be having more. We'll be having one at the end of the month and then one in November and then one in December. And I have offered to all the finalists for them to be on the show. So I do have one other person's coming up later today. And Eureka, raise your hand. So um, hopefully all four of them join in and in my corner of the world support Extreme Hunters for Tom and Olivia. And having said that, ladies, you're amazing. I know you were amazing before, Jackie, but 
I'm not going to gush anymore about <laughs> you hosting me. And Meadow, it's just always a pleasure to be around you, to talk with you. And you're an ambassador full-time for Women Who Hunt. And I'm going to give a little plug for KJ Houtman book, Women Who Hunt, Why Women Hunt, pardon me. And Meadow is in that book. Go get it. It's a great book. And then there's 18 ladies from around the country that have been spotlighted and written about. And it's a coffee table book. It's something that you can have out forever. Who's the publisher of that, Meadow? I want to say it's Wild River, but I cannot recall. Yeah, I believe it is. And Tom, what's Tom's last name? I believe it's Paro, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, okay. And it's published by Wild River. The publisher is Tom Perrell, and the author is K.J. Houtman from Minnesota. So there you go, K.J., and there you go, Tom. Free shout-out for you. Get the book because it'll give you insight to 18 different women, of which four of them have been on the show, Brenda Valentine, Nancy Jo Adams, Mia Anstein, and Middle Cowfield. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Bruce, for having me. I really appreciate it. And Meadow, I really appreciate it. And that's the whole thing, guys. If it would have never been for Extreme Hunters, none of us would be having these conversations. And that's just the truth. And so, true. and Meadow, I'm going to go hunt with you. I will. And I want you to come hunt with me. And that's the bonds and the relationships you establish. And that's why it's so important because we truly love it, no matter how big our trophies are. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> Oh, I look forward to talking to Jackie again in October. i looking forward to hearing about her elk stories, and I'll be getting back from a black bill hunt with my dad, so we'll have some things to share. That'll be good. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.